everybody, Mark's Back to Comics, and I'm back this time with my Moon Knight Episode 4 breakdown, some of the Easter eggs. I'm going to tie in some of the Episode 3 in there as well. Um, didn't get a chance to do it last week. Time just got by me and just, you know, things happen. So uh, we'll get right into it. We'll start right towards the end of the episode, which I think a lot of people are going to be really confused about and like just really what happened so i'm going to give you my take on that we start right at the end there where they end up finding the tomb of alexander the great mark knows that the ushamti is probably in his mouth because he talks about having the voice you know since um alexander the great was the last avatar for amit so he looks down in his mouth finds it and then lo and behold harrow shows up so he gives him a chance to hand it over or else. So obviously Mark decides against that, starts fighting off a few of his soldiers, and lo and behold, Harrow shoots him twice in the chest. And then you can clearly see that he's, he's dead there. He's just floating there. And all of a sudden you start, he starts floating down. And if you look closely at his chest, those two uh, shots to his chest you know, fade away. It's no longer there. And... Um, you know, this is kind of a tie back to the original origin story from Moon Knight on how, you know, he gains his powers. He gets killed by the Bushmen. So this is a little bit different where he gets killed by Bushmen and then Kanchu grants him his power shortly after. This time, they changed it up. He floats down and then you see him appear at the mental institution, which is a big tie back to the Jeff Lemire's run of Moon Knight. So, but before we get into that, if you remember in episode one at the museum, Stephen talks to this little girl about the sarcophagus. And, you know, in order for you to get safe passage into the afterlife, you have to be judged and, you know, going into the field of reeds. So I got a feeling here he is being judged. And um, what ends up happening, you know, here is if you remember the story about the balancing of the scales, you, I believe it's Anubis. Anubis um, brings your heart onto the scale and then on the other side is a feather. And if your heart is heavier than the feather, you don't end up getting safe passage and then Amit eats you. <laughs> and then you're, you're, you're basically haunted for the rest of your you know, your eternity. If it's not heavier, obviously you get safe passage and you can live happily in the afterlife. So I think this is what's happening here. This is kind of like a, a theory where um, if you remember in the end of the episode where he's walking around, he sees a lot of different things moving. If you remember, you see the walls moving. You see some of the lights tilting back and forth. I got a feeling he's in this like state of purgatory where he's being judged. And while he's waiting judgment, he is probably on Anubis's boat from ancient Egyptian mythology where he's waiting judgment and he's not actually in the mental institution, which you know wouldn't make sense. Why, why are the walls moving all of a sudden as he's running away? Um, but before we get into that, let's talk a little bit about the Easter eggs that we see in that mental institution. You open up, you see them playing a game of bingo. You see Crowley there right in the beginning is, is counting the numbers. If you remember Crowley, Crowley was the guy sitting on that bench that he was talking to, Stephen was talking to when he was in, uh, I think in London in episode one and in episode two, I believe. So while you're being judged here, on a, what I'm theorizing is Anubis' boat, you start to see things from past and present all surrounding ar around you while you're waiting judgment. So you're going to see, obviously, his workers, his friends. You see Layla there. You see Crowley. Um, you see the two detectives that were working for Harrow there. Uh, you, you also saw Adana there. And then, ultimately, you see Harrow in, uh, in there, 
you end up seeing Harrow as his psychologist or psychiatrist. We don't know it in this setting. Going back into the comics, in Jeff Lemire's run, Moon Knight issue number three, Dr. Emmett is possessed by Amit. You know, she's his psychologist or psychiatrist in the, in the story, but they replace that with Harrow because obviously it's, it's going to be visions of, you know, people that he recognizes, you know, memories and so forth that he's going to be experiencing while he's in judgment or purgatory, whatever you want to call it. So, but in the room, you see a ton of Easter eggs. Um, you see Harrow's cane. You see, you know, in the corner, you see his shoes that he was wearing in the real world. Um, you see a pyramid in there, which is reminiscent of the overvoid or the void. That's where the gods, you know, that area outside of Earth where they can't actually appear physically on Earth. That's where they're stationed. Um, you see... The crocodile head, Amit, as, as a statue. You see a lot of Easter eggs in, in that room. And then the room itself is also very reminiscent of Harrow's compound, except it's all white instead. Um, you see a lot of statues, Egyptian statues. You even see the Swiss village in there as well. And some people are asking me, is this a tie to Doctor Doom? Because of Latveria and those are two different areas in the comics, but um, it's obviously reminiscent of uh, episode two when he is in that Swiss village running away. So you see a ton of Easter eggs, and then he gets off off the chair, and he you know he's like he's like it's you you shot me, and he he starts crawling away on the floor because you know he's heavily sedated at this point because of his uh, ability to just lash out at the workers this point like i said from the beginning is when he starts running outside the the room starts going down the corridors and this is where you see the the lights moving back and forth the walls moving back and forth and you hear that eerily sound of what a ship sounds like and that's why i think they're on anubis's ship waiting judgment so and this ties into the next section where it makes sense to me is he sees a sarcophagus it opens up, and it's Stephen. And like I said, in this state of purgatory, anybody in your past, present, you know, you can view them because it's, you know, part of memories. And while you're casting judgment or you're in that limbo state, anything goes. So you're able to see Stephen there. He's able to hug him. He's able to talk to him. And then they run down the hallway, and you see another sarcophagus, and that sarcophagus has Jake Lockley in there. And we haven't been formally introduced yet to Jake Lockley. We did see what I thought was Jake Lockley in episode, I think it was episode three, when they're on the rooftop and they're fighting those um, those guys there and he, he kills one of them and then he has that flash. And um, it was like, Steven or Mark, what would you do? I didn't do that, you know? So that was what I thought was Jake Lockley. And he appears to be a lot more savage and ruthless in this series than he is in the comics. So um, I'm wondering if they introduce him into episode five. So if you're not familiar with Jake Lockley, he's the cab driver. He's the one that works on the streets, you know, drives a bunch of people, gathers intel. And they work cohesively with, you know, the other personalities to help, you know, help Moon Knight out on his missions. So um, he's going to be a critical piece, and hopefully they introduce him in the next episode. So that's really all I'm going to say on Jake Lockley for now. So they're running down the hallway, and then they open up the door, and <laughs> you get this uh, deity, which is our first you know, deity that you see in person, and that is uh, Towerette. So who's Towerette, and why is she important for this show? So Tarot's a goddess in hippo form. She was, you know, already dressed in her ancient Egyptian clothing. And, you know, she speaks kindly to Stephen and Mark saying hi in a nice cheerful voice. So um, nonetheless, you know, they're shocked to see even a hippo goddess appear to them, you know, that closely. So, but um, so why is she important? You know, 
Taurat is, you know, an ancient Egyptian goddess of childbirth and fertility. The name itself means she who is great or simply the great one. You know, she's commonly respectful to the dangerous deities that we have been already introduced to or will be introduced to in the uh, in the show. But, um, you know, she is what I think is going to help Mark and Steven get out of this purgatory state while they're waiting to be judged. And I think if they're going to be judged by Amit, they're going to end up getting killed, which obviously would put a twist to the show and it would end the show. So I don't think that's going to happen, obviously. But um, she's also known as the mistress of pure water, the lady of the birth house, she who removes water. And if you saw there at the end, when he got shot, he was drifting down into the water and his chest wounds were removed. So I believe she also helped out with that. She is going to also help rejuvenate or, you know, kind of make them reborn again. So instead of having Kanchu do that like he did in the comics, she is going to be the one that's going to end up doing that, taking them away from, you know, casting judgment. So that's my theory. I expect that to happen in episode five. And they're going to ultimately continue with the battle against Harrow. All right, so that's my explanation of the ending of the show. She also, in you know, ancient Egyptian history, has um, ties with Bast. So um, there was an Easter egg of Bast, and we'll get into that now that we're going to be talking about the beginning and middle parts of the show, which there wasn't too much that I thought went on in terms of like... Um, story progression and just like the whole you know what i've been getting a lot of complaints of the moon knight series has been pretty boring or there's not been a lot of moon knight action and i get that you know i, I want moon knight action as well so i'm hoping if my theory is correct and she does rejuvenate or makes them reborn reborn again you're going to get moon knight appear in episode five and then you're going to get that big battle against harrow in six so going into episode four you know, there's a little bit of action right in the beginning. They're getting shot at by some, I guess, rebels after they were escaping, which I thought was kind of silly. But um, they drive off and they get down into the tomb and get into that Easter egg I was talking about with Bast. So as he's looking around, you see him standing right next to this statue. Not statue, but it was like a structure of what appears to be a cat lying. And that's the Easter egg I'm thinking is Bast. So um, they start walking down the hallway and then into a new room. And they see, you know, this uh, area looks like what they, you know, looks like a, a maze. And it's like it has six points. And, uh, oh, the six points. You know, Steven starts drawing out the Eye of Horus. And in ancient Egyptian mythology... The Eye of Horus is the protector of the afterlife or the underworld, which leads me back to Tauret. And obviously in the end of the episode where he gets shot and killed. So a little Easter egg that leads into the end of the episode. So then they're walking and then they end up seeing these, you know, high priests or Heka priests. It's uh, Heka priests were basically, you know, left there to protect the tomb of the Pharaoh. And um, we end up finding out the tomb of the Pharaoh is Alexander the Great. But um, these Heka priests were essentially just sorcerers of their time. And the reason that they're able to stay there and, you know, basically attack is because of their sorcery, their magic. And you end up seeing <laughs> these uh, priests, you know, running around the... Um, the, the maze killing some of Harrow's you know soldiers and it was a pretty cool and creepy scene where you see them you know basically taking out the organs and what well, looks like they were going to be harvesting them I don't know if it was part of the spell to help you know bring back one of the Pharaohs or whatever the case was but it was a pretty creepy scene you see them running away you know Stephen goes one way Layla goes another way and then 
you get that you know classic scene that you see in these like um indiana joan movies or tomb raider movies where you get caught by that mummy and you get dragged back which was pretty funny but then you get to that scene where um she's by herself trying to climb over the rocks and it very reminiscent of uh indiana jones and then all of a sudden you hear uh harrow pop out and they have us conversation you know about they start talking about more about layla's history do that conversation with Harrow was going to be my last uh, Easter egg, you know, theory, speculation, whatever you want to call it. But um, he mentions my little scarab. So getting into that. So in episode three, we took a little bit of a deeper dive into Layla's background. And, and Marvel doesn't do this by accident. When they start focusing on a different character outside of the main character in a series it's to help develop the character into the future so pay attention to this and um, so this could be potentially a new key character to look out for in the future but uh, anyways it's revealed that Layla is originally from Egypt and her father was an archaeologist who was murdered you know a fact that continues to you know haunt Layla till this day in the comics Obviously, Marlene is Mark's husband, and her father was a famous archaeologist. So they just basically swapped this over for Layla, and Bushman was the one that murdered. So um, Harrow, you know, was saying that it was Layla's husband, Mark, that had something to do with the father's death. So by this point, it's clear that the mystery surrounding Layla's father and the murder will be a major plot point going into the last two episodes um Kanchu had previously mentioned and i think it was in episode two that um you know threatened basically mark that layla was going to be the next avatar if mark ever left his services similar to how harrow left um Kanchu's back in the day before going into amit so Conscious choice for his next director may stem from reasoning deeper than a threat to Mark or an admiration of her abilities, but rather an interest in her family's history. So, what does this mean going forward? And who could Layla actually be? I thought initially when I thought of the name Layla, they were going into a little bit of the Easter egg for maybe mutants because there is a Layla Miller in the comics. And there was that tie, obviously, to Madripoor that they talked about. She was potentially a dealer of antiquities, a dealer of ancient Egypt, uh, Egyptian relics. And they mentioned that in Madripoor, in Madripoor, there was Sharon Carter. She was the pawnbroker. So I thought maybe that was going to be ties to the, you know, mutants, because X-Men had a big, you know, dealing in Madripoor, but I think it's going to be something different. So, if you remember in episode 3, we we were, you know, shown that she had a passport and it revealed her name was Layla Abdallah al Fuli, and in Arabic, Abdallah means servant of the gods. But, um, more importantly, in the comics, there's a character with a very similar name, Abdul Fawl which is, in the comics, he's an expert archaeologist and the Egyptian hero known as the Scarlet Scarab. I believe the Scarlet Scarab's first appearance in comics is Invaders 23, and I think also has another appearance in 25. But, um, which, remember, Harrow did mention the word Little Scarab. So, Easter egg. He also needed to be in possession of the ancient artifact known as the Ruby Scar in order to harness its powers, which consisted of super strength, durability, flight, and the ability to drain others' powers. Um, does this, some of these power sets do sound a little familiar? You know, Captain America does have some of these powers like super strength and durability, not flight and drain, you know, others' powers. So this is a little bit different, but... In the comics, he was an anti-British uh, imperialist. Abdul used the scarab to protect the Egyptian people during World War II. 
you know, World War II, Captain America, similar to his origin story. So are they developing Layla as the next, you know, I guess Egyptian version of Captain America? Um, going further into this, on his deathbed, he told his son, Mehmet, to continue the search for the scarab. After years of searching, Mehmet tracked down the artifact and became the second Scarlet Scarab. The similarity in Layla's name with that of Abdul Fawls and the fact that her father used to call her the Little Scarab could simply be nods to the comics. That small little, you know, tied to the comics, but obviously a little twist. Um, you know, so in the MCU, Layla could walk in Mehmet's footsteps to become the second Scarlet Scarab. So in the comics, the second Scarlet Scarab, which, you know, would be Mehmet, was uh, Thor issue number 326 from December of 1982. It's a pretty cool cover as well. But um, it's what I think is going to be unlikely that Layla will become the Scarlet Scarab by the end of the Moon Knight series. The series could help her on her path to be explored in a future Disney Plus series. Also due to her black market links in Madripoor history, Layla could eventually become an acquaintance, an acquaintance or an enemy of the power broker Sharon Carter. So, you know, which obviously has potential similarities with Captain America, you know, yada yada. Whatever the case may be, it's safe to assume Moon Knight will not be the last appearance of Layla fully in the mcu all right guys so that'll wrap it up for this time hopefully you guys enjoyed the breakdown for episode four i did tie in some of the stuff from episode three in there as well stay tuned for the last two episodes of the series i'm excited to see what they do with this and until next time mark spectacomics